So welcome everybody, and we're, we're glad to have Mary Rubinus with us from MIFA, and I'll introduce her before handing her the controls in a little while. Um, welcome, and uh, we're going to be off. We're going to be on next week. Next week there'll be a uh, autism support session, autism center in the South Shore with the Ark of the South Shore and Karen McHugh and Daryl Cook. And then the following Monday, we're going to take off and celebrate Independence Day. And it's also uh, time for Americans with Disabilities Act in July as well. So it's a big month uh, for a lot of reasons. So let me, uh, let me looking forward to have uh, really talk about the ABLE accounts again. And uh, when I introduced Mary, um, one of the biggest things was historically, right, when Fidelity chose to call it attainable uh, instead of just able, you know, they wanted to brand it. And um, I'll, I'll be curious to hear from you how that's worked out. But we hopefully will let a lot of people know about it again. So thanks, everybody, for your support. Your support makes a big difference. And we start off, I don't know how long we'll keep starting off with COVID-19, but we're on the back end, um, I hope. Uh, as you know, State of Emergency ended last week. Uh, here's a bunch of people listening to music in their uh, driveway. Um, but some health professionals are still debating about people, you know, needing to wear masks indoors. And there's still that debate going on, especially if you have lower thresholds around your immunization, even if you've gotten the virus. So just keep that in mind. If you're a family member, takes medication especially, that the um, potency of that immunization is not going to be as high. And we know this from personal experience as well. But there's, as you know, there's always been a debate throughout this, how to get the economy going and yet be safe at the same time. Uh, the incre now, the good news is um, the numbers have dropped. Uh, last week, actually, the numbers went up compared to the week before. But this time, they've truly dropped by more than half in terms of positive uh, viruses. And the deaths have dropped nearly 40%, thank goodness. Uh, 27 people did still die in that seven day period. Uh, we're looking at probably Friday to Friday of last week to the week before. And we've had 17,593 people die, but which is sad and, and something to memorialize and remember. Um, and if any of us have had that happen to us, we know what it's like to have family or friends pass away. Um, and hopefully, you know, these signs are hopeful will continue in this trend and uh, we'll be talking about zeros. Uh, this is the congregate care sort of numbers. Um, the actually, uh, the last time I checked, Rentham still had less than five who had caught the virus. Right now, as you see the numbers in the state side, there's less than five out of 1,041 people. There's zero on the private provider side. Uh, and there's no deaths in the past week. And this is the number from last Wednesday. Um, and as I reported last week, we've had 186 deaths overall, which is a 2% rate of people passing away. And again, against Massachusetts, we're more than four times higher. So 2% is great in some ways, but 0.25% is our state's average against the population. I'm comparing to the population served. It's obviously a select population. So people could argue with me when I use, you know, when I do the comparison that way. Um, but it is, we are at more risk in our constituents. And uh, the good news is, again, the virus activity is down, no deaths reported. Um, and you can access, when you get the PDF, you'll see there's uh, new guidances are out lifting many restrictions. Each agency will respond to that differently, be aware of that. Um, and we're always happy to take any messages or calls, but we really encourage you to talk to that agency's management if you're feeling like, hey, you know, here's the new guidance. Can you help me understand why we're not quite adhering to this? I think a lot of agencies will adhere um, to the more um, loosened restrictions. Uh, in the United States, we've got 33.34 uh, million people who have had the virus in the past period week. There's been about a growth of 95,000 people. Uh, and there's been a total of 598,713 deaths, which is up 2,654 people from the week before. So it's, it's not gone. It's amazing that we can talk about these numbers like this, honestly, talking about 2,654 people. And, and some of these 
People may have died more quickly because of COVID, <clears throat> but it's still a very real number. It's very real going on. And in terms of states, the highest per capita states are still North Dakota, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Utah, and Tennessee. I can't, they, they have been stuck there for a while, maybe changing places. But as of June 16th, Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire are in the lowest eight states. In fact, Vermont and Maine are in the lowest, I think, five states, okay? So that's how well they're doing. Hawaii is the lowest uh, this past week. And then Massachusetts and Connecticut are in the lowest 24th, four. So in other words, you know, Massachusetts is at number 24 from the bottom in terms of the lowest, um, not 24 from the highest. <laughs> and Connecticut's uh, lower than that. And then New York is about eight positions higher in terms of per capita. Uh, so it has a higher pot, you know, and New Jersey actually has the highest out of the states I just told you, you know, in terms of our sort of nexus of states that were around. Uh, and I, I use New Jersey because they have a similar population. They're a little bigger than us. Um, but I always like using using them as an example. So that's, that's the situation. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, I guess I'll continue this into July. And then at, at that point, we'll figure out you know, um, what we'll do, what, what our game plan is in terms of COVID, and uh, maybe we'll be talking about COVID analysis. So, Mary is the Attainable Outreach Manager for MIFA. So, I'm even calling it the Attainable Outreach. You also, I know, do the U plan work and things like, right, in terms of the products. You're an Emerson College grad. You joined MIFA in 2017, um, and Fidelity is MIFA's fund partner. Um, Fidelity branded it as attainable. Um, and I have someone close to me that actually was working in Fidelity, um, and it still is, when that plan happened on the website, uh, even though the person's in accounting, and they were like, now, what's your opinion that they're branding this, <laughs> you know, the powers that be? So I had a sort of closer inside look at that. And then MIFA, for those of you who don't know, it's been around for years. It's the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority, and it was established as a nonprofit self-financing state authority. And so it's, it's great to have this opportunity. Carrie's going to help me, obviously, and do most of the nudging, but I'm dying to um, get you off track to start with Mary and just ask you about the branding thing. And we, you know, and, um, but I'll tell you, me, me and Fidelity haven't missed a step in rolling out the program. I just have to say, even though I tease about the branded name, um, people are thrilled when it came online here. They were just chomping at the bit, bit. and hopefully, uh, we'll get it to the place where it's truly uh, not only uh, attainable for people, but also the numbers are such, right, that it's, that it's something that uh, everyone's happy to see, you know, in terms of the growth. So welcome. And Carrie, you know, feel free to also help with the reins here. Thank you. Thanks, Leo. <clears throat> I'm gonna unshare. Yeah. All right, then Mary can share. Okay. And Mary, I, I've um, been working with Mary, I don't know, and how long since uh, you're, she is at every transition conference, uh, resource fair, uh, and she'll speak to any webinar or live training and just has really, um, she, she runs on the ground. So uh, we're really fortunate to have her knowledge. Um, you know, you just have to ask a question and it gets answered right away. So thanks, Mary, for all the work that you've done. And I'm excited to hear today. Well, thank you both for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I laughed when you were talking about the branding, but coming from a um, marketing kind of background PR, um, I, yeah, honestly, all the, all the plans are branded, um, like nationwide. So they all have some type of, you know, Cal Able or Stable is the Ohio program, which is a collaboration of a bunch of states. So um, I guess each program manager has kind of put their footprint on it a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, so hence the name Attainable, which is a great, honestly, which is a great name. So thanks, uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And um, I usually start by just sharing um, a little bit about MIFA and Fidelity and, and the partnership. And so uh, I am here today to talk about Attainable, which is the Massachusetts ABLE Savings Plan. Um, it is available nationwide. You don't have to be a Mass resident to open one of these. Um, my role in the program is really outreach and education, um, 
you know, partnership building, Carrie mentioned, you know, we've known each other for a while, um, really just definitely on the ground, just trying to get the word out about the program and about the benefits to have an Enable account, but also forming relationships. That's been a really important um, part of this and goal for us is to build relationships with the organizations and we continue to do that. But um, that's really um, the best way along with some other ways that we can get the word out. So um, continue to do work on that. And so um, my role, um, I work for MIFA and we are the state sponsor and Fidelity is the program manager, meaning if you're going to open one of these, you go to Fidelity, you go to the Fidelity site to do that. And so a little about, I'm just going to minimize this here, get rid of that and move it up. Um, a little about MIFA and what we do if you're not familiar. Um, we are a not-for-profit, Leo mentioned this a little bit, state authority, which was created back in 1982, uh, and we help families plan, save, and pay for college. So you're probably wondering, what does Attainable have to do with this, um, you know, this, this mission? Um, so we also offer some tax advantage savings plans, and Attainable is one of those, um, in addition to the youth fund that Leo mentioned, and that is the Massachusetts 529. We also offer a plan, which is a, a prepaid program that you can um, essentially buy a percentage of tuition at a college. But in addition to that, we just do a lot of guidance, free guidance around the whole process of applying to school, um, around financial aid and planning and admission. So if you're not familiar with us, um, definitely go to the MIFA site, MIFA.org, to check out what we do. Um, we deliver a lot of content on a weekly basis. And um, it's, a, it's a great organization and a great mission. I'm happy to be a part of it. And so a little about this partnership with MIFA and Fidelity. Um, when Attainable was launched in 2017, um, MIFA chose Fidelity to manage the program for us. But that came about as our uh, previous relationship with them with that Massachusetts 529, which dated back to 1999. So we began our partnership with them in 1999 when we selected them to manage the youth fund, which is the college savings plan, Massachusetts plan. Um, so it was natural for us to partner with them um, when Attainable was launched in 2017. Um, they are, as Leo mentioned, a great um, partner. They certainly cross all the T's. They're very passionate about the program and have done a lot to continue to try to um, evolve it and change it and um, make it better, frankly. And it is certainly like all the plans are work in progress, but um, we are ticking away at that and um, continue to do so. And so hence this, this partnership together between MIFA and Fidelity. And so we obviously chose them for their expertise in money management. And then with our expertise in college financing, it's a really nice um, um, relationship and partnership that we have with them. And so a little history, I guess, to start um, how ABLE accounts came about. So the um, ABLE Act was actually federally legislated back in 2014, and it stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience, or ABLE Act. And it amended the federal tax code in 2014 to add this section 529A, which is an ABLE account, um, to, you know, um, um, our tax code. And so the legislation established these ABLE accounts, which are a tax exempt account for an eligible individual with a disability to use it for qualified disability expenses while still keeping their eligibility for federal public benefits if you receive them. And so eligibility, in order to be eligible for an ABLE account, how are you eligible? So the disability has to have occurred prior to the age of 26. And then if that individual is getting SSI or SSDI, SSDI due to their disability, they're automatically eligible to open an ABLE account. Um, or if you meet the age requirement prior to 26, and then your disability, Social Security has a list of what they consider to be compassionate allowances. If it's listed within that, you're gonna be eligible. Or lastly, um, essentially, you self-certify that you have a diagnosis of a physical, intellectual, developmental, mental health diagnosis. Um, again, that Social Security might have in their blue book um, that has lasted or expected to last for at least a year. You're going to be eligible um, to open an ABLE account. The last one, again, you're just essentially self-certifying. We do tell people um, you don't need documentation when you open the account. You open it online. We do tell people that you should have some type of documentation from an MD stating you do have this disability and just keep it in your files at home. Um, but that's a quick snapshot of, in terms of um, 
eligibility. So expenses, excuse me, these are some of the qualified expenses for ABLE accounts. A broad category of things, it's gonna be things like healthcare, housing, you can use it to pay your rent, your mortgage, educational expenses, transportation, so not only um, buying a car, but you can also use this for Uber and Lyft, um, assistive technology, employment training and support, PCA or personal support services, and then lastly, basic living needs. So things like clothing, food, you can use your ABLE account um, to pay for those as well. And so some of the benefits of these accounts, um, you know, attainable or enable account, it really, um, the, the first one initially is really allowing this, the account owner, I should say, or beneficiary is um, the person with the disability, they are the account owner and enable account. It's allowing them to save over $2,000 without it affecting those federal benefits. So that's really the first big one. Um, so currently, if you are getting benefits, um, you know, in order to save over that $2,000, you have to have an ABLE account for a special needs trust. So it's allowing an individual to do that. Um, secondly, this is, again, a nice, um, quali uh, nice quality to these accounts is it permits the account to be owned by the individual with a disability. Um, and then if they, if they can, they're managing that account themselves. Um, if they cannot, or if they're a minor, um, you can set up what's called a PSA, a person with signature authority and that's gonna be a parent, a guardian, or a power of attorney on that ABLE account, and they would manage that for that individual if they need help doing so. Anyone can contribute to one of these, family, friends, obviously the person with the um, disability if they're working. Um, it you know, provides immediate access to these funds. You can, essentially it operates like a checking account, a savings account, um, you're using it to pay your bills. And then lastly, it provides an individual um, with financial independence, and there are multiple tax benefits that come with having these accounts. I'll talk about a few of those, what they are. So some of the specifics um, for attainable, um, this is the same across the board, the first paragraph um, uh, nationwide for all the plans, and there are currently over 40 ABLE plans nationwide. Um, the total annual contribution you can put in an ABLE account in a calendar year is currently $15,000. However, if the beneficiary or account owner is working, they can add an additional $12,760 from their work earnings um, to their ABLE account, so potentially up to $27,760 um, in a year. Um, this is called the ABLE to Work Act. It was federally legislated. Um, and it allows you to add additional earnings if that account owner or beneficiary is working. Um, one thing to keep in mind with this, if you do take advantage of this, you can't also participate in the employer's retirement plan. Um, it's an either or, you have to do one or the other. Um, in terms of our program for attainable, the max that you can save in one of these accounts is $500,000. And then lastly, um, if you are getting SSI, um, the number to keep in mind is you can save up to $100,000 with no impact on your SSI. So quite a bit of money that you can save um, in the account with no impact on your SSI benefits. And then lastly, there is no annual account fee for our program. Um, so I usually mention that at the end. When you are opening an ABLE account, um, they function similar to a regular 529, if you're familiar with those. And those are portfolios. And these are the same across the, the portfolios are different, obviously, program to program, but functionality, all ABLE accounts function this way. Um, and so you are choosing a portfolio based on your risk tolerance. Um, they're going to be a mix of stocks and bonds, short-term securities. Um, you can see at the top, there's a low-risk money market, and then they just get more aggressive in growth. Again, that's going to be based on the mix. Um, higher percentage of stocks, potential for higher return, but potential for greater risk. So you're gonna choose based on that. The folks at Fidelity can definitely help you with that, obviously. You can go to their site to learn more. Um, you can change the allocation on these twice a year. So you can change up your portfolios twice a year. Um, there are fees, just like a regular 529, there are fees on these as well. I mentioned there's no annual account maintenance fee, but there are fees for the management of your money on these portfolios. They're investment fees based on what you choose. And the fees range from 0.57% of assets to 0.94% of assets. So less than 1% of 
um, is, is the investment fee that they charge to um, manage the money for you. So some of the tax benefits I mentioned, the first one, um, I see this a lot, I've heard financial planners talk about this a lot, is overfunded 529s. So um, potentially a family has saved for um, a family member and realize that they're, they're not gonna go to college or have saved too much money in a 529 or maybe have um, a sibling of um, a potential ABLE account owner um, they have money in that sibling's account that they want to transfer into um, the ABLE account owner's um, ABLE account. So now, provided you can't do that, so provided the beneficiary is the same individual on both accounts, or like I mentioned, a sibling, um, a beneficiary is a family member of the other, a sibling, you can transfer up to 15 k from a 529 into an ABLE account with no tax or penalty um, in a period of 12 months. Um, so that's a really nice benefit. The other one is this savers credit, which essentially is a tax deduction that you can take on your ABLE account. Um, it's for the ABLE account owner based on certain criteria in terms of their adjusted gross income yearly, how much they're making, and also what they're contributing to their ABLE account. I believe for an individual, I think the max is $2,000 that you can take, um, that you could receive on your federal taxes. Um, so you could take essentially um, a tax deduction based on your contribution into your ABLE account. Um, you're eligible for this if you're 18 or older, not a full-time student, and not claimed as a dependent on another person's return. And then lastly, this big one too, um, as long as the withdrawals um, are spent on a qualified dis disability expense, um, any growth that you have in attainable or an ABLE account is federal income tax free. So you're not gonna pay taxes, on those earnings and you also don't pay Massachusetts state income tax as well, which is really nice. This is a video I thought I would share. Um, it's always been my passion because I am a mom of a daughter with a disability um, to share stories and just to share real life people using these accounts and how they've been beneficial. Um, so I met Brian Gway and his mom, Anne, along the way through a mass rehab counselor named Kathy Kelly, who is wonderful. And um, we, I wanted to share his story. We were able to share it and CNBC did a story on them and also locally Channel 5 picked it up. So I thought I would play it um, just so you could hear how Brian has um, reaped the benefits from having his ABLE account. It's quick. That's me. Brian Gway can picture his future. This is my brain's idea. Brian Austin Gray is the next generation in a long line of farmers. Brian may have autism, but today at age 25, Brian only accepts two labels, artist and farmer. I'm going to have my farmer's business someday. To achieve that dream, his mom Ann explained he needed a plan. So he got this yeah. idea that he should be able to save money. Brian also got three jobs. This is my work schedule. Six days a week, Brian works at Home Goods, a goat farm, and a horse barn. But for people with disabilities, saving those paychecks can be complicated. Brian benefits from a lot of public services, and there were restrictions as to how much money he could have in his name. That changed in 2014 with a federal law nicknamed the ABLE Act. It provided a new option for people with disabilities to build a fund for both short-term and long-term expenses. You can save and the interest that you earn on these accounts is, is not taxed. Similar to a 529 plan for college funds, MIFA offers an ABLE account called the Attainable Savings Plan. It has no minimums, no fees, and there are no worries about losing Medicaid or Supplemental Security income benefits. Fidelity manages the investment portfolio Portfolio, but unlike a 529 plan, ABLE account holders can withdraw amounts at any time without penalty. Right around 3,000 folks have begun to save. We're seeing the average account balance is about $8,000, which is pretty healthy when you consider it's a relatively short time frame. Now that Brian has an account, he deposits about $1,000 each month from his paychecks. He saved a substantial amount of money. And our dream is to look into other opportunities, whether that be we purchase a farm, we buy an interest in something, that he'll have choices. In the meantime, Brian sets his alarm for 5.30 every morning. He says it's good practice. I wake up every day because I'm farmer.
Saves $1,000 a month. That's through hard work. Like 529 accounts, relatives and friends can also make contributions to one of these ABLE accounts. For more information about how to open one, you can check out our WCVB app. All right, and I'll just mention that video is, I guess, a few years old at this point. So we have actually tripled our account since um, since that aired. So we are definitely continuing continuing to rise. Usually at the end, I like to share just a few resources that are really helpful if you're not familiar with ABLE. And the first one is this ABLE National Resource Center or ablenrc.org. It's a phenomenal place to go if you're not familiar with ABLE accounts. They um, offer you know, many webinars about, you know, all the different ins and outs of ABLE. Um, just there's a lot of information there. They're on social media. I encourage you to follow them there. They have a um, comparison chart that's actually really helpful that compares trusts and ABLE accounts and the distinct benefits of both. Um, so I encourage you to go there. They also compare state plans as well. Um, so it's a great resource. The other one is obviously the MEFA site. MIFA.org, where we have a dedicated, dedicated landing page for Attainable, which you know we have kind of built out with some local resources, including benefits counseling, and also obviously details around our program. And then lastly, to open an account, you're gonna to go to fidelity.com forward slash ABLE to open one of these and to learn more. And then if you're interested in hearing about events or webinars that we're doing or updates to the program, you can also sign up on the Attainable landing page to receive the emails um, so that you stay up to date on anything that we're doing around Attainable or also just in the disability space. I recently did a webinar um, with three area colleges around disability support um, via student services at their colleges for someone with a disability um, transitioning, say, from high school or just even just attending. So um, we don't sometimes just focus on attainable. We try to, I guess, have collaborator blended content, which I think is really important. And then lastly, my uh, email, and these are the social channels that we're on, um, uh, MIFA's social channels, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We push content daily and weekly, and we push a lot of it. Um, so I encourage you to follow us if you're on social. Um, as well. And always feel free to email me. I'm happy to um, answer any questions or um, if you just want to learn more, feel free to email me at mrubanis at mifa.org. So that is my last slide. So I will stop share. Now let some things All right. Finish. Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah, just great information. Um, we do have a number of questions in the chat. Um, a couple questions about SSDI, and, and uh, Mary did warn me. She said that, you know, whenever I do my presentations, uh, the whole benefits uh, comes up. So that's the, you know, talking about uh, contacting a benefits counselor. You don't have to receive MRC services to access them, and they're terrific. They know all about SSI, SSDI, and can really guide you. So that's um, Kathy Kelly's up in the Northeast, um, but they have benefits counselors all over the state. So um, one of those SSDI questions was, can they be uh, put directly into, deposited into an ABLE account? So, yeah. So again, I, I always try to stay in my lane, which is important. And I'm not a benefits counselor. So I encourage people, if you aren't working with one, to look for that because they really are the experts. And so you want to consult an expert when it comes to something like that. Um, just anecdotally, I have heard um, through a benefits counselor that um, that money that comes from Social Security should always be deposited in a separate account use the way you know use use it the way it's intended what it's for and then if there's any money left over then you can put it into able but i have heard through those benefits counselors it's better to put it into that separate account um, and then like i said use it the way it's intended and then move it over but again that being said i highly encourage um mass you know to, to seek out the benefits counseling mass rehab commission and uh, work without limits also splits the state with them they primarily i believe do the western part of the state um, but I do have a contact there as well, and he's great. He's phenomenal at answering some of these questions. So I'm happy to connect um, if people might need um, a question answered. Great. Um, thanks, Mary. Um, there's also a question about uh, someone uh, 
uh, opened up in an able out in Ohio. Uh, Ohio Stable <laughs> mm -hmm. is their brand. And um, now she was wondering, how do I, how does she, is it easy to close and bring my money back into Massachusetts? Yeah, so it is. I mean, obviously you would have to have the account opened. You would open the attainable account. And then, you know, there's obviously paperwork for that where you would roll over um, the funds from another program into attainable if you choose to do that. Uh, but I would, my advice is, yeah, talk to the programs because obviously they're going to have paperwork or requirements in order to do that. Okay. And then um, Carolyn was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how to get the money out. Um, there's no checks. Yeah. So, and it is a savings account. So how do people make withdrawals? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah. So um, essentially, you know, I say it operates like a savings or checking account because you really are using this money to pay your bills. Um, and so how it works is you move the money from the ABLE account to your personal checking account and then pay your bills. Um, that being said, I will share and not to give people a popsicle headache a little bit, but Fidelity has some great free digital tools and I encourage people to take advantage of them because they are free. Um, and one of them is um, called Full View and it allows you to track and categorize and see all your accounts in one place. Um, and so that's really helpful for an ABLE account owner to track and categorize your expenses. In order to link to Full View, you have to have what's called a cash management account, um, a CMA, which is just a free checking account, same as a checking account that Fidelity offers. And you can link that to Attainable. So you open the, when you open Attainable, you might say, I wanna link it to the cash management account. You make sure that you're able to do that perhaps with the rep's help. Um, and then once you have that cash management account opened, um, you can then link it to full view, which allows you to track and categorize your expenses. The cash management account, their checking account, Fidelity's checking account, comes with free check writing and a debit card, which is really nice. So um, there are no checks for an ABLE account, but essentially how you use it is you move the funds to your personal checking account and then pay your bills. So you're going to have checks for that. Great. That Thank answer? you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, okay. So another SSDI question. Um, does the $100,000 cap include those receiving SSDI? So my understanding of SSDI um, is that it's not, unlike SSI, it's not means tested. But again, I would check with somebody who does benefits um, to clarify that. But my understanding is um, that it, it, you know, it, there would be, there is no impact. But again, I would check with someone who works in that, you know, in that lane. Yep. And is there an age after, uh, after which an account may not be opened? No. So an account, you know, is no, an account can be opened at any age. Um, as long as a disability has occurred prior to 26, um, you could have a four-year-old that you're opening an account for, um, you know, 10 year old, it could be somebody who is, you know, 35 and disabilities occurred prior to age 26, as long as the disabilities occurred prior to age 26. Um, that's the criteria for opening an account. Terrific. Thank you. Somebody just asked about uh, the slides. Yeah, and they're just chatting in. Yep, everybody's going to get slides at the end of the presentation. Um, okay, and let's see what kind of record keeping is uh, required for ABLE? So we just tell people like you would for your regular taxes, keep track of, you know, keep um, track of how you're spending the account. Um, that, that's really the only criteria and that, you know, is on the account owner to do so. But like I just mentioned, that's why I tell people um, take advantage of the digital tool if it works for you, because full view really allows you to track and categorize those expenses, which is helpful for ABLE. Um, but essentially, just like you would for other things for your taxes, you're just going to, um, you know, keep keep record of that. Okay, terrific. Um, and then another question about, uh, you know, how do you how do you decide where to open an ABLE account? You know, you've got the, the, you know, there's several states in the country that offer ABLE and how do you really kind of compare and make decisions about what the best one is for you? Yep. Do you have any advice on that? Sure. So functionality, all the accounts, all ABLE accounts function the same way. And what I mean by that is 
the annual contribution limit, how you use the account, they all function the same way. The difference in the um, programs is who manages it, um, which would be the program manager, also the fee structure um, for that particular program. Um, you know, the portfolios may look a little bit different. So it's really, it's really that, that's the, the differentiator. Um, you can go to ABLE National Resource, and I believe they have a um, comparison tool where you can compare three plans together. Um, we tell people, um, always look to your home state first because it may offer a tax deduction that an out-of-state plan doesn't. Um, currently, Massachusetts does not offer a state tax deduction for an ABLE account. They do for um, a college savings account, so that may change in the future. Um, there is a state tax deduction for a, a regular 529. Um, some states do offer a tax deduction for, again, state residents. So essentially, you know, do your homework. I mean, they are all wonderful. All the plan plans are wonderful. We all work together to spread awareness about ABLE. It's really just personal decision making in terms of um, the program you choose based on that criteria. All righty. Can you have more than one ABLE account? You cannot. That's a great question. You can only have one. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All righty. And um, Leo, thank you for, uh, he put in the chat the, the links for the disability, for the benefits counselors and um, talk about record keeping. Oh, okay, this is a good one. The, the account must belong to the disabled individual, not to the manager. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so an ABLE account um, is the, the uh, person with the disability is the account owner or um, beneficiary on an ABLE account. So they are the account owner or the beneficiary and they manage the account themselves. If they can't, you can set up what's called a PSA or person with signature authority and they would be um, attached to the account and manage the account for that individual and that individual has to be a parent a guardian or a power of attorney um, I will say I'll share this um, we get many requests and Carrie knows about this about rep payees being um, you know um, a PSA on the account and that is something that we are currently um, trying to integrate into the program and we are hopeful that that will come about by the end of this year um, so a rep payee would be able to be um, a PSA on the account. Alrighty um, okay so uh, let's see my son's SSI goes directly into the checking for daily expenses and then we make transfers to ABLE if, his, if it comes close to two thousand dollars. Is it best to have SSI go into the ABLE or uh, and then set up a checking account link? So again, yeah, I, I have heard anecdotally through uh, a benefits counselor that it is best to uh, have the SS, the Social Security money go directly into um, a separate account, whatever account that may be that you designate. Um, you use it the way it's intended and then if there's anything left, you can put it into ABLE so you stay under, you know, that $2,000 um, asset cap. Um, again, this is a question, definitely want to clarify it with a benefits counselor, but my understanding is that's the best um, strategy for that is to have it go into a separate account and then um, put it into ABLE. That being said, you can direct deposit into ABLE Social Security money. Um, you know, legally you can't do that, but I've heard from the benefits counselors that they prefer it, it happen, um, you know, through after, you know, going into the other account and then the, you use it and then it goes to ABLE after that. So recommendation is to check with the benefits counselors on that, but legally you can put it directly in. Okay, great. Thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about the difference between, uh, or how, how do you determine when you need a trust or should you do ABLE? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question and kind of a loaded question, I guess, but um, I'll do my best to sort of try to uh, answer that. So honestly, um, I think this is part of a bigger um, um, view of looking at things from a financial planning view or, or sort of an overhead view. But um, you know, part of that conversation is working potentially with, um, you know, 
know, a planner, a financial planner, or potentially, or someone who might help you with this. But there are definitely distinct benefits between trusts, special needs trusts, and ABLE. Um, honestly, I tell people if you can do both, do both because they are both great tools. And I tell people they can work really nicely together. They are very complementary. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, there are things that you can do with a trust that you can't do with ABLE. And so an example of that would be you can put real estate into a trust. You can't do that with ABLE. Um, there are obviously contribution limit amounts with ABLE. With a trust, that's going to differ. Um, however, with ABLE, you can pay your housing expense directly from it. You can't do that with a trust, especially if you're getting benefits. Um, but I do know I've heard you can move money from ABLE into the trust and then um, or I should say move money from the trust into ABLE and then pay your housing expense. So distinct advantages and benefits to each. If you have the opportunity to do both, they're certainly complementary and can work together. And I think that's um, a dis you know, larger discussion on that. So we'll kind of end yeah. that there. And a lot of hey, Mary, I was, Perry, let me just ask Mary a question. One of the things, sure. uh, and of course, I think everybody should have an ABLE account. <laughs> let me say that because it's so flexible in, in many ways, right? But one of the things for people to keep into account, I think I'm correct on this, but you're gonna be the person who knows. If something happens to the individual, if the individual passes away before a certain time, you know, unexpectedly, you know, mm -hmm. that those count, any dollars left in that account does go, no, to the federal, does that money get held? So, yes. Yeah. Money? Yeah. Yep, I know, yep, exactly. Um, so what happens, so when an ABLE account owner passes away, the money in the account goes to that individual's estate. Prior to that happening, you can use it to pay funeral expenses, burial expenses, um, but it does go to the estate. I think what you're talking about, Leo, is the Medicaid recovery or clawback. And so how that works, there is a Medicaid um, clawback or recovery in Massachusetts. It's not related to ABLE. Um, it is a Medicaid thing. It does exist. So it exists whether you have an ABLE account or not. How it relates to ABLE is that, um, if you received um, Medicaid, um, it would only be applicable from the time you've opened the ABLE account until you're passing. So if you had received Medicaid prior to your ABLE account opening, that's, dis that's not you know, included, it's disregarded. So it would only be from the time uh, the account is opened until you're passing. The state, the legal languages may or have the potential to claw back some of the money that they paid out to that individual minus any premiums that they paid into the system. Um, and like I said, it, it exists whether you have one or not. The only way to avoid it is to have the trust. Um, it's definitely not a deterrent not to have an ABLE account. I think you just need to think wisely about um, all your options and, and what you're doing with all your options. But um, yeah, people should definitely be aware. It does exist in Massachusetts. Some states have actually passed legislation um, to get rid of it and, um, and ABLE accounts would be exempt from that. And so um, potentially if, if you know, Again, if people talk to their representatives, Massachusetts could do that as well if that were to happen. But um, yeah, currently it does exist. Definitely not a reason not to do an ABLE account. I just think you need to be wise about, um, you know, just full picture on everything. Great. Um, and then um, uh, somebody was looking for a very concise list of what the ABLE Act can be used for. And I'm wondering, is that on the MIFA website? So we have the same, um, that same graphic that I showed that's in the slides. Um, I'm not sure what they mean by concise list. I, I mean, I, I tell people that honestly, there are quite a few things you can use it for. Um, people, I think, are looking for the super definitive list of I can use it for X or I can use it for Y. Um, I think as long as you follow the guidelines for what it's you know, intended for, you'll find that there's plenty to use it for. Um, there isn't this super concise list. I mean, ABLE National Resource might go into uh, some deviations, but um, essentially it's all these basic expenses. They really don't, nobody, nobody deviates from that. Like some people will say, can you use it for a vacation? Um, and, and the answer to that is, well, if you can, um, I guess, um, justify some of the language around that is if it benefits your overall health or quality of life independence, then if you can argue that with the IRS, then you could say I can use it for a vacation. That account owner could use it for a vacation. So yeah, essentially what we showed today is what you can use it for. Um, okay. but, but it's not, I guess I should back up and say it's not exhaustive. 
um, you know, things like, um, you know, if you had a child that needed to go to therapeutic camp, could you use the ABLE account for that? Absolutely, because it directly um, connects to their disability and they can use it for that. So that's what I mean when there are things that fall outside that list. It's certainly not exhaustive, but it's got to be connected in some way. Terrific. Okay. I think we went through the questions. Um, so in perfect timing, because it's uh, just about 10 minutes of uh, one o'clock. So thank you, Mary. Um, I did want to say that Mary is going to, for any of you who are on the Massachusetts Transition to Adulthood Facebook group, we're going to begin um, offering uh, different guest posters on, uh, on the Facebook book group and Mary has um, volunteered to give a brief five minute Facebook live um, on ABLE uh, starting uh, next week, next Tuesday mm -hmm. at quarter of 11. So it's only going to be about five minutes long. It's going to give you a little snippet. It's not as thorough as today, but you know, it's great. Um, and I would encourage everybody to follow ABLE because, you know, it's still relatively new. And there's going to be changes. And um, so it's important to stay on top of it, um, like you have to do for any, any kind of benefits you, <laughs> you get for your, for your loved ones. So thank you, Mary. That was a great presentation. You're welcome. Um, and um, appreciate you taking the time. Thank You're you. Welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mary. And uh, I'm going to echo Carrie. Everybody should have one because it is so darn flexible. And uh, there's so many ways off that list that they can use it. Uh, so that you've shared with people today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both for having me. This was great. And um, it really is. I mean, there's no downside to having one of these, no. honestly. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I encourage people. It's all about just educating yourself and learning more. And um, yeah, I think that Brian Gray video kind of shows, obviously awesome. not kind of, it does show um, how impactful it's been for him and to be able to save, so. Yeah, that's awesome. So, okay. Well, thank you. And thanks all, all of you for attending today. And um, you'll get the slides later on today. And thanks again. Have a great one. Keep cool. Thank Bye -bye. you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.